thank you, Karen. It's great to be here with you and and all the wonderful folks at AFA. It's a, quite an honor to be with you again. And as as I explained in in my last talk at uh, World War III conference put on by AFA, um, there is an intricate and very in depth relationship between the CCP and the globalist organizations that we all know and hate. Um, the UN obviously is the the primary example of this. Um, you have communist Chinese operatives all over the organization from the top to the bottom out of 15 specialized agencies, card carrying members of the CCP run about one third of those uh, for perspective. An American runs one. And um, that gives you a sense of how far they've infiltrated. And even in the organizations where they don't have a card carrying CCP member running the organization itself, they have a minion or they have the deputy director general, or in some cases, both. Uh, if you look at UNESCO, for example, the deputy director of UNESCO, who oversees, by the way, all of their educational activities, is a member of the CCP. Uh, you look at the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, technically he's an Ethiopian Marxist, but he was put there with the overt assistance of the CCP. Not only did they publicly support him behind the scenes, if you talk to the diplomats who are involved in these things, they say, oh yeah, China was arm twisting, China was bullying, China was making sure that this guy gets in there, along with their good buddy, Bill Gates, or Bill Gates of hell, as I call him. So you have the CCP all over the UN. And you know, I think normal people who've worked in these organizations, they say, oh, well, you know, we all take an oath to the international institution. We all promise we're going to leave behind our country and our political party and our loyalties and only serve the international organization. But it's very different when it comes to the CCP. They have said repeatedly that all Chinese working within international institutions need to be loyal first to the motherland, and they need to carry out faithfully CCP instructions. They've said this on their own propaganda television networks, uh, and, and they've been very, very aggressive in enforcing this. And this whole process came about because of the CCP's relationship with other international organizations. One of the major ones is, of course, the World Economic Forum. People don't realize the World Economic Forum has actually worked very, very closely with the CCP to reform the economy so that it could be turned into an economic superpower. So on the one hand, they're deliberately sabotaging the economy of the United States under various pretexts, uh, global warming being uh, the, the most recent and most ridiculous example. Got to shut down our power plants, shut down energy exploration so that we can move all our factories to China so they can put far more CO2 into the atmosphere. Totally ludicrous, totally ludicrous. And it actually, in my opinion, proves that the people pushing this don't even believe it themselves. But let's leave that aside for a minute. The World Economic Forum brags that it built communist China into a superpower. Klaus Schwab has talked publicly about how for 40 years they have been helping the CCP build their economy, reform their economy into the monster that it is today. Of course, the World Trade Organization played a critical role in doing that as well, allowing China to overtake international markets using subversion, using uh, unfair trade practices. And of course, it didn't help that Western economies were led by politicians who felt like shooting us in the foot, cutting off our nose. Uh, and then, you know, uh, sabotaging every sector of our economy that they could, allowing the communist Chinese agents to steal all of our technology, et cetera, et cetera. So you look at all these different international organizations and, you know, the UN and the World Economic Forum are two of the big ones, but the IMF, uh, same thing applies, right? Uh, they've been working very, very closely with Putin, very, very closely with Xi Jinping. Uh, this is an orchestrated process. It's a fundamental restructuring of the global order. The way these globalists have been putting it for over a decade now, they're building what they call a multipolar world order. In other words, the United States is the unchallengeable, hegemonic, unipolar uh, anchor of the world order is now going down. It's being uh, brought down to size. And in its place, in the place of this order, will rise one dominated by the CCP, dominated by the Kremlin, dominated by BRICS, dominated by international regional organizations like the African Union and the European Union. So the United States, at least if these globalist evildoers working with China get their way, will be dramatically cut down to size, uh, massive uh, dislocations in the economy, massive undermining of our military might, massive undermining of our diplomatic uh, clout and prestige. So that in the place of that crumbling order, I would say uh, order being demolished on purpose, can rise this new order where communist China's ideas about human rights are just as valid as uh, America's or anybody else's. It's a very, very dangerous process. And uh, I think the critical thing to understand about this is not necessarily the mechanics and who's who and which Chinese agent is working in which agency, 
The critical thing to understand is that the most powerful people in the United States are deliberately helping this process. When you have George Soros come out and publicly say that communist China needs to own the new world order like the United States owned the previous one, that should terrify you. When you have people like the Bidens taking money from CCP front companies directly into their bank accounts for who knows what favors in exchange, that should terrify everyone. When you have uh, high level State Department bureaucrats openly saying, we want China to play a much greater role in international affairs, that should terrify everyone. So this has been engineered this way with the deliberate assistance of very high-ranking government officials, corporate officials, and international bureaucracies. And it's a major threat to the peace, stability, and the liberty of the world. The, the multipolar world order that they're building is really a unipolar world order, not in terms of geography or, or governments, but in terms of the ideas that will run it. And it, it's really interesting because there's been an incredible convergence. And people like Kissinger and, and the Rockefellers, they've been talking about convergence for decades. That was always mm -hmm. the plan. Uh, Zivnu Brzezinski, right, former national security advisor for Jimmy Carter, uh, one of the co-founders of the Trilateral Commission. They've been talking about this idea of convergence for a very long time, that we would eventually need a global convergence, not just in living standards, but in governing styles, et cetera. And that's what we're watching right now. If you listen to Klaus Schwab articulate his vision for the world, it's unbelievably similar to the communist Chinese vision for the world. And it includes every aspect, right? The economy, for example, Klaus Schwab calls it stakeholder capitalism. Mm -hmm. The communist Chinese call it uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. It's the same thing. It's absolutely the same thing. You have a, a, a Benito Mussolini, when he defined fascism, defined it as the merger of state and corporate power. That's what we're talking about here. If you go to communist China, yes, there are corporations, but they serve the government, as Klaus Schwab would say when he outlines his state stakeholder model. So instead of having what we traditionally have had in the free world, in, in the Western world, adversarial relationships between governments and business and the media and nonprofit organizations and civil society and political parties, all of them go into lockstep into this multi-stakeholder model where everybody is brought on board. And so this is now the model that the UN is promoting. It's the model that the Vatican is promoting with the Vatican Council on Inclusive Capitalism. It's the model that the World Economic Forum has been promoting for years. And it's the model that is used in communist China. So you can almost think of communist China as like, the role model for all this, the, the test bed, like, you know, how, how will it work if we do this? Well, if you want to know what it'll look like, look at communist China. Total control. Yes, they've introduced some market forces because they know that pure Marxism and as, as an economic doctrine is, is totally absurd. I mean, it destroys so much wealth that everybody ends up starving uh, before you know it. So they had to introduce some market mechanisms in there, pricing and things like this, just to avoid the whole thing collapsing and all wealth being evaporated. So when you look at the model in China, that's the same model that Klaus Schwab is promoting. That's the same model that these international organizations are promoting. And at this point, they don't even bother to hide it anymore. So when we talk about a new multipolar world order, yes, there may be different governments involved in calling the shots than previously, but the ideas will all be remarkably similar. It may be fascism with Chinese characteristics or fascism with Davos characteristics, but it's all the same evil ideology. And it means the end of human freedom, the end of economic prosperity, the end of the middle class, and the emergence, they hope, of a permanent ruling elite that will be be beyond the reach of pesky voters that will be beyond the reach of pesky consumers. And um, yeah, as as they um, have been advocating for so many years, we'll have a world where, um, you know, you don't have interference in the affairs of the state. It, it, you know, Pat Wood talks about technocracy. It, it's such yes. a good word to describe what we're talking about here, because under the guise of efficiency or sustainability or pick your silly buzz suddenly we need to give up all of our political power all of our economic yeah. power to alleged experts that's the model they use in china exactly. there their experts are called communist party commissar or whatever um in the west they're engineers and scientists but it's ultimately all the same model karen the fact that the united states has been moving in this direction very rapidly um and we still have kind of the the cutouts of the institutions that we used to have but yes. they look totally different when you look under the hood um we have every sector of society now being uh, uh, sucked into this public private partnership model even where people don't think about it. you know you drive down the street you see oh catholic hospital uh, trinity evangelical hospital jewish memorial hospital 
they're all taking their instructions from the federal government because they take Medicaid money and they take Medicare money. This is what's happening to every industry. Oh, they got a bailout. Well, they got to do what Washington, D.C. says. Oh, uh, they, they don't want to be put out of business by new regulations. They better do what Washington, D.C. says. So we've moved even in the United States toward this fascistic model where we no longer have a free market. Winners and losers are largely decided by not even the political class anymore, the deep state, the administrative state, the people who are in the permanent bureaucracy, and then the forces behind them that kind of uh, guide policy in a more general direction, people at organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations and the Bilderberg and the Trilateral Commission, and, uh, the World Economic Forum, all these semi-secret gatherings of people that think they know better. They think that if we undermine sovereignty, we'll have world peace, et cetera, et cetera. Public-private right. partnership model is one of the key mechanisms they have used. And you're right, it, to to an average person who doesn't think too much about it, it sounds superficially nice. It makes us think of, well, you know, we don't want the city government to hire a bunch of people to build a road. Why not just contract that out to a company that knows how to do it? And that's all fine and well. There's a time and a place for government to contract things. We know government yes. doesn't do very many things very well. And so mm -hmm. if they need a missile, rather than, you know, hiring a bunch of engineers and building missiles, just pay a company that already has the engineers that has the know-how to do that. That's fine and dandy. What we're talking about here with the public-private partnership, to go back to Benito Mussolini, is fascism. It's where you yes. have the merger of state and corporate power. And, and it's a wonderful model for these guys, for the elitists who, who want to rip us off, because they suck a bunch of money out of the taxpayer under the guise of profits. They make us mm -hmm. pay for all the losses and we lose total control as voters. Because, oh, that's, that's a private organization. So uh, in, in every sense, the taxpayer is losing, the citizen is losing, the voter is losing. And I, I would encourage people to think of public-private partnerships as fascism, as the stakeholder model, as socialism with Chinese characteristics. It's all ultimately the same thing. All the power centers merge, and it's basically the citizen against not just the state, but everything. One, one of the places you see it most clearly, Karen, is in the UN's plans for humanity, right? So uh, right now, they've got the 100-year plan for humanity. That's the Agenda 21, the agenda for the 21st century. And over and over again, it, it calls for, in different forms and fashions, this exact model. All power center being consolidated in the hands of uh, unelected, uh, uh, centralized authority. And we see this so clearly with the 2030 agenda. The 2030 agenda is the 15-year plan. Right? Think back to the Soviet Union. They had the five-year plan, the 10-year plan. So the UN's got the same thing. And their 15-year plan from 2015 to 2030, they call it the 2030 agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals. And there are 17 of these goals. Um, and a lot of it sounds like Marxism. Right? You read goal number 10, and it says uh, we got to... Uh, have more equality. So we need to redistribute the wealth. We, we've got to reduce inequality. It says not just within countries anymore, but among countries. So now mm -hmm. global wealth redistribution. But if you look at the model that they are pursuing, and they haven't been shy about this, they've been putting out press releases, they're actually nakedly pursuing uh, the, the so-called three-legged stool model, where you bring in not just the public sector and the private sector, but also the religious sector. It's It's been fascinating because I've had a front row seat to watch this. So in 2015, they had the General Assembly meeting. That's where they came up with it, where, where they approved, I should say, the 2030 agenda. And the Chinese communists were bragging about what a they, they said a crucial role they played in creating this 2030 agenda, which will not be a surprise to anybody who's read it. Uh, the dictator of Zimbabwe, the mass murdering, genocidal Marxist um, Robert Mugabe. Oh, he was so pleased it was going to usher in a brave new world. He said a new world order where we would all live in peace and harmony. So. Um, <laughs> What they've done here with this is they have brought the business community in and they're bringing the religions of the world in. And, and they've done this very specifically and very openly. So in 2019, the UN signed what they called a strategic partnership with the World Economic Forum to promote the 2030 agenda. And the role of the World Economic Forum, according to the agreement, and the UN and the World Economic Forum both put out press releases about this, was to bring the global business community on board with the 2030 agenda and with implementing the 2030 agenda. So there you've got all the governments of the world through the UN General Assembly. You've got all the major businesses of the world through the World Economic Forum, the Fortune 500, and everybody who wants to be taken seriously now has got to be part of the Davos thing. And then they've got a, another organization that runs in parallel with these. It's called Religions for Peace. And in 2019, again, critical year, they met in Germany 
and they came up and they, they claim to represent all the religions of the world. I, I just had, I was teaching at a church yesterday. I asked pastor, are you a member? He said, no. Oh, OK. So not all the anyways, <laughs> not all. all the religions of the world is how the leader says we're the U.N. of religions. And in 2019, they signed a declaration where they committed all of their followers, all of their flocks and faithful to human development. It says as set forth in the 2030 Agenda Sustainable Development Goals. So that's the three-legged stool model right there that Peter Drucker used to talk about. You've got the public sector, the private sector, the social sector being primarily religious organizations, all marching in lockstep for this international agenda that the head of the UN General Assembly, when it was approved, called the Master Plan for Humanity. And that leaves people like us who are saying, wait a minute, this is crazy. What are you people doing? Why would we want global tyranny? Um, we're on the outside. We're against all the governments, all the businesses, and all the religions of the world. You must be some kind of extremist. One good place to start looking is at his first term in office. Uh, he was a one-man wrecking ball, a bull in a globalist China shop, just destroying everything he could get his hands on. Um, you know, I, I mean, If you look at the list of UN agencies he got us out of, it's very impressive. Uh, UNESCO, the UN Education Agency, the World Health Organization, uh, UNRWA, which is filled with Hamas terrorists who, who love to kill Jews. Uh, and actually, they got caught. Right? Um, it, yes. it, you look at uh, he slapped sanctions on the ICC, the International Criminal Court. He got us out of the Paris Agreement. One of his first acts upon taking office was getting us out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right? They're using these regional agreements to bring about this kind of global system. So he was just a disaster from the globalist perspective. And he was also very much more than the current regime in favor of free markets and and reducing the role of government. So for every regulation that they passed, they had to get rid of two. So he, he opened up uh, energy exploration again to the point where we became energy independent for the first time since the Eisenhower administration. So he was like a torpedo aimed right into this uh, monstrous ship of global tyranny. So uh, Trump would have tremendous ability to expose and to stop this evil agenda in its tracks. Uh, obviously, the globalists are not just going to take it lying down and and uh, you know play dead. Uh, they will fight back in every way they possibly can. The communist Chinese will fight back. The Iranians will fight back. The Russians will fight back. The globalists in D.C. and New York will fight back. But um, Trump has a lot he can do. And I think he learned a lot from uh, his first term about who he can trust, how the government works. And uh, I think we'll see a much more effective uh, effort to undermine this global agenda if and when Trump is back in the White House. I do think we're in World War III. I think we are in the midst of it now and people just haven't realized it. Uh, it's a very, very dangerous situation we find ourselves in. And and at this point, you almost have to go out of your way or just watch the fake media to not realize that this is going yeah, on. Yeah. I mean, you, you have the Russians on a constant basis now saying, Wait, we're going to nuke you. We're going to nuke you. Like, pay attention, guys. We're going to nuke you. Uh, and they've said publicly at the highest level, Foreign Minister uh, Sergei Lavrov, these guys are saying openly, we consider you to be a party to this war you by you giving missiles to them that they're using on us we consider yeah. you to be a belligerent in this when world war three breaks out it's not just going to be in europe we're going to hit you in the homeland uh, so i think we are already in the midst of this you see what's going on in the middle east um with israel and uh, the iranians and the arabs and and hezbollah and hamas uh, then you look at what's happening in china i think xi jinping is just biding his time waiting for the perfect moment to strike and try to take over the free Chinese on Taiwan. So all of that coming together in a massive global conflagration. And I think if the United States had not been deliberately weakened, deliberately bled dry, deliberately had its industries gutted and shipped overseas, if we had not had our national security deliberately undermined, it wouldn't have been a big deal. As, as Lincoln said, right, all the armies of Europe and Asia combined couldn't take a drink from our rivers unless we allowed them to. If we're going to die, it's going to be from national suicide. And I'm concerned that if and when the shooting component of World War III breaks mm -hmm. out, um, the United States is in a very, very vulnerable position right now because of deliberate subversion. So I think all of these things are going together. And I think from the perspective of the globalists, a, a lot of people don't understand this component. You know, they think, well, why, why would the power brokers want war? Well, they've told us why they want war. Uh, go back and look in 1962, the U.S. State Department commissioned a report from Lincoln Bloomfield, intelligence operative, a critical guy from the Council on Foreign Relations. And the title of the report gave it all away was called uh, A World Effectively Controlled by the United Nations. And the whole purpose of the report was to figure out how do we get to that? How do we get out of the Westphalian system that we've had yes. you know, going back to the 1640s into this new system where the UN would basically call the shots? 
And he concluded that if we just allow organic processes to work on their own, we're looking at hundreds of years before we can have a, a world truly governed by the United Nations. So he said to accelerate this process, we need a catalyst. The catalyst, the fastest and most effective catalyst will be war, crisis, and the threat of war. Uh, and that's what we have seen historically. You look at World War One. What was the result? Uh, the League of Nations. Right. You look at World War Two. What was the result? Uh, not just the UN, which everybody knows, but the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, you even other institutions that people don't, I think, uh, associate as much with globalism, like the European Union. That was born in the aftermath of World War Two with the European coal yeah. and steel community. That's what eventually grew into this uh, European super state that now has more power in many ways than the U.S. federal government has over the states. So it's a very dangerous situation. And when you realize that from their perspective, a cataclysmic global war would be a great leap forward, forgive the um, double entendre there, <laughs> into a new world system, you, that makes it all the more dangerous because we've got people at, in the United States, people in Europe who think, hey, this will help us advance this new world vision that we have. And so I think we're in the midst of it. I think it may well get worse in the not too distant future if we're not careful. And uh, I hope and pray that we can avoid it because it would be a disaster for everybody on the planet.